I'm going to remind you that the battery was invented about 200 years ago by a professor. This is Alessandro Volta, who invented the battery at the University of Padua. You see a stack of coins, zinc and silver, separated by cardboard soaked in brine. Gave us electrochemistry and gave us technology almost immediately, electroplating, electroforming and so on. So it moved quickly from the university laboratory out into the commercial world. And what about today? What about grid level storage? Well, grid level storage would be fantastic. It would uh, reduce price volatility, um, reduce the demand charges, peak shaving. We had grid level storage at, at scale. Uh, increase grid reliability, separate the transmission and generator assets, uh, give us much more autonomy. And finally, transmission line congestion is a huge problem. A lot of places we have the power, but we can't get it to the demand site. So all of this would be enabled today. And then as far as tomorrow goes, we'd be able to change the way we design the grid. Right now, we design to peak with a reserve margin. And we hit that peak very small percentage of the time. Instead, we could design to average, and that would save a huge amount of investment and reduce the amount of pollution that we generate in uh, electricity. Microgrids without storage wouldn't achieve their full value. And then this last one, you know, if we're going to get wind and solar into base load, and if they're going to reach their full potential, we have to address their intermittency. In, in our world, we expect electricity to come out of the power outlet on demand. We can't have a situation where, well, the sun isn't shining brightly, all oh, the wind isn't blowing. We don't want that. So storage is the key enabler here. So what's the path forward? Why don't we have these batteries yet? I mean, it's been over 200 years. What's wrong with the researchers here? Well, it's battery versus combustion. For backup, to deal with intermittency, it's diesel, it's natural gas peaking units. And that's a really tough problem to compete with. You've got to think differently. And, and just to keep it really clear, today's lithium ion batteries fail miserably. They're far too costly. It's a 20 year old technology, and it's come down to an asymptote that's just way too expensive for this market. So, what do we have to do? We've got to think differently. We've got to invent to the price point of the electricity market. And that means two things. One is we've got to be cheap constituents, and we've got to have a simple technology that's easy to manufacture. You can't have billion-dollar uh, manufacturing facilities. That's the problem with lithium-ion. So you've got to confine your chemistry to earth-abundant elements. I like to say if you want to make something dirt cheap, you make it out of dirt and preferably make it out of American dirt, and that way you don't trade dependence on imported petroleum for dependence on imported neodymium or something like that. So, how about the manufacturing piece? Well, for that I looked not to other batteries. I disregarded batteries, instead looked to another industry, an industry that I'd been doing research in, which is how to make aluminum, magnesium, heavy-duty electrometallurgy. So let's look at an aluminum smelter. This is what a modern aluminum smelter looks like. The breadth of this thing is probably 50, 60 feet, and it recedes about a half a mile. And it's making aluminum. This is the sound. Hear it? Yeah, the sound of electrons in motion. That's an aluminum smelter. And this is the inspiration for the battery that I invented. You bring bauxite from one corner of the globe. You bring in petroleum coke. That's carbon. You need six kilowatt hours a pound to make aluminum, and the capital cost of that plant is about $5,000 an annual ton, and yet you can make virgin metal for 50 cents a pound. That's an economic miracle. And I looked at that and said, is there anything I can learn from this that I could apply to stationary storage at grid level? How am I going to convert this, which is a giant electricity consumer, into a giant electricity donor? Can we make the aluminum smelter bi-directional? Well, I did. About seven years ago, I started with a small seed grant at MIT and invented this thing called the liquid metal battery. Three layers, just as Volta's battery, only they're not solids, they're liquids. Got a liquid metal on the top, molten salt in between, and a liquid metal on the bottom. 
no separators, no membranes. The metal is insoluble in the salt, and the salt is insoluble in the metal. It's like salad oil and vinegar. Pour some mercury in there, and then you have your three layers, if you have any mercury in your house. And uh, the, the thing stays at temperature by the action of electric current. The current flows, generates heat. In a lithium ion battery, that's your threat. Here, I take that heat and I capture it, keep the battery at temperature. Charge, discharge, insulation, there it is. It's simple to build. You just shovel the salt and the metal in, seal the can with TIG welding, and away we go. It sounds great, doesn't it? And then, in late 2009, I got major funding from the private sector, Total, and from the public sector. This was the new branch of the Department of Energy, ARPA-E. And with these two sources of funding, we were able to put together a multinational strike force of students, graduate students, postdocs, visiting scientists, and we were able to make huge progress. And we were able to reduce this to practice in a variety of chemistries. The little cell is one amp hour, it's about a, an inch in diameter. Then there's a hockey puck size, which everybody knows is three inches in diameter. And then the saucer size, 200 amp hour, so we could see this thing scale. And then to accelerate commercialization, we established a startup company called it Liquid Metal Battery Corporation, which is a mouthful, and eventually we changed the name to Ambry, which is the heart of Cambridge. That's where we invented the battery. And it was a five-letter pronounceable word for which the domain name was still available. <laughs> so we established that. We've got 30 people working about two miles from here. And now we've got cells that are 16 inches in diameter, a single cell, one kilowatt hour. This thing puts out 250 amps for four hours. Not milliamps, 250 amps. Really goes. And one of the notional designs has these things stacked into modules and then aggregate the modules into something the size of a 40-foot shipping container. That'll give you two megawatt hours, two million watt hours. And that's enough energy for about 200 American households. So I call this grid-level storage. It's silent. You ever heard a gas-fired peaking unit? Very loud. Emissions-free, no pollution. No moving parts. You don't want those pumps and motors and so on. Remotely controlled. This thing can take a signal from the grid. It can be charging. And then all of a sudden gets involved in frequency regulation. It can act as a load, or it can act as a source, or it can act as both at the same time. And it's designed to the price point of today's electricity market. Not asking for subsidies, not asking for special taxes or anything like that. Designed to the price point. So what's left to do? We're still discovering new chemistries at MIT. We, we thought we discovered a a liquid metal battery, we've discovered an entire universe of energy storage. There's nobody working in this area. Liquid metals, molten salts, it's all gone. So we're generating our own people to push the research forward. We've got new chemistries that operate at lower and lower temperatures, some of them down at 250 degrees C. That means you don't need a steel can, you can put them in a polymer can. Much, much lower, 10-year, 15-year lifetime. And then, of course, at the startup company, be ready in about a year's time with an operational prototype. And then, we're going to go global. But how did we go global? Well, did I mention these things are frightfully heavy? So you can't steal that 40-foot shipping container. If you tie up a truck to that and try to move it, it won't move. So we're going to have to go global by moving things locally. So who's going to build these batteries everywhere? Partnership with strategic partners. So I hope I've convinced you that there are ways to deal with these thorny issues. And it means thinking very, very differently. It's not taking an existing battery and trying to repurpose it for something very large. Most people have a scale up problem. For us, it's a scale down problem. Thank you.